I think without any sort of further ado, I wanted to introduce Neil Gershenfeld, and he has some extremely interesting insights, if you listen very carefully, about the origins and the future of computing itself and of manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. Can we switch to whatever you numbered this? Oh, we are. And can you put it up here also? Thanks. Um, so in the next 20 or so minutes, I want to explain this slide. Uh, in the first TED talk I did, there was a, th uh, here also please, thanks. There was a throwaway line, uh, computer science was the worst thing to happen either to computers or to science, which I'm happy to take credit for. Um, but uh, CERN asked me to come back and explain what I meant. And so that's roughly what I want to do in the next 20 minutes is to explain what I meant. Um, uh, with colleagues, I started this program, the Center for Bits and Atoms, because I couldn't tell the difference between computer science and physical science. I just never understood that boundary between hardware and software. Uh, here's an amusing number. Last year, there was this study. Uh, businesses spun off from MIT um, are the fall between the world's ninth and tenth economies between Russia and India, the economic output, which is crazy. It's a few thousand people. Um, Within that number, and just, yeah, just briefly on a point Tron made, almost none of this is done to make money. It's made with visions of change, and it's made with culture of how you want to work, not with how to make money. Within that, these are some of the things we've spun off and some of the people. And I want to start by talking about two people. One of my students, Jason, is still currently in charge of all the computing infrastructure at Facebook all the data centers, all the facilities. And another student had that job at Twitter. He built all of their computing infrastructure until recently Uber hired him away for the self-driving program. And it's weird, a program as small as mine would have uh, both Facebook and Twitter, but the reason is on the scale of them, you can't pretend there's a difference between hardware and software. You have to think much more deeply about dollars, pounds, and watts to information and integrate them at a much more fundamental level. Um, and so with Rafi, uh, I wrote this paper, which I think is the first thing called the Internet of Things. This was at the very beginning of that. Rafi went on to start Twitter, um, the, sorry, not start Twitter, but create all of their computing. He was the VP of the infrastructure. And I wrote this with Danny Cohen. Um, how many of you know who Danny is? It's so sad. Um, so Danny was a dear colleague. He's not well. With Vin Cerf, I ran this FESH trip. Um, how many of you heard, have heard of the protocol UDP and TCP? <laughs> so before Danny, IP and TCP and UDP were the same thing. He was the one who separated f flow control from routing. Um, how many of you heard of VoIP? <laughs> of course you have. Danny started that. How many of you heard of uh, chip foundries? Of course you have. Danny started that. He's this founder of the internet nobody else had heard of. But within, um, we did this fast drift, and you can, um, hear all the stories. And so Danny got interested in work we were doing, not research, but just hacks to implement IP stacks in you know, uh, t tens of cents of silicon and hundreds of bytes of code. And that's what led to this early work on what we called Internet of Things. Um, we've gotten involved more recently because much of what's now called the Internet of Things is actually the BitNet of Things and has kind of gone off the rails in the discussion I can tell you about that. But I want to go on. So that's Internet of Things. One of the funny things that came out of that was a project with Diana Reese, Vince Cerf, and Peter Gabriel to extend the Internet just, not just to things but to species. This was a TED talk we did on an interspecies Internet. Uh, Peter Gabriel was playing music with cognitive apes and find they were better musicians than the ones he were working with. And um, what emerged is cognition emerged continuously, not discontinuously. And so um, it, it's a serious project to create an interspecies internet. And I'll have to leave a little bit early today to go see the board of the San Diego Zoo, where we're going to add them as one of the nodes in this interspecies internet. They have the same kind of cognitive needs as people. So that's internet to the rest of the planet. But that's still ignoring a lot of resources. Um, one of my students, Ben Vigoda, spun off a, a fabulous chip company, Lyric, bought by Analog Devices, where we have analog and digital, but the digital devices have analog degrees of freedom. And so here what he's doing is solving digital problems in the space of the digital system, but cheating and using analog device degrees of freedom to go into the interior. And that has great savings in noise and power, all kinds of performance, by remembering that the digital circuits solving digital problems have analog degrees of freedom. So that was Lyric Semiconductor. Um, another resource 
is uh, quantum mechanics. We made the first quantum computer that used fewer steps than classical uh, by implementing a um, database search of an unordered list in root and time by programming nuclear quantum coherence with Hamiltonian engineering, taking advantage of the inherent computing in nuclear bonds. You can view it as amazing as molecules compute. For us, it's sort of the opposite, that the equations of physics are the IT of a few hundred years ago. Computation is a much more natural description of physics, and you can sort of view it as strange that the computing physics can do partial differential equations. Um, and so, yet yeah, these projects did have to do with making computers, but they had much more to do with about thinking of computation as a model of physics. Um, another resource is mass. This was a computation we did to do universal digital logic in uh, microfluidics, where you use the Navier-Stokes equation to do droplet-droplet interaction. Um, this is high-speed micro video slowed down, so now bits can transport mass. So if you want to do chemical reactions or synthesis or printing, instead of interfacing a computer, you can do universal digital logic and droplet-droplet interactions. And what we showed is how you can use the Navier-Stokes equation to do uh, digital logic. In turn, to program all of those, and, and just in this quick tour, um, that, that wide range of beautiful physics, um, we're stuck with this lineage. So, John von Neumann did a number of profound things. Uh, this isn't one of them. Um, he wrote a, a draft report of the EDVAC, and that shows this wasn't meant for posterity. But this, this is really the only place von Neumann wrote about the von Neumann architecture. He never really wrote about it. Not like the beautiful things he did. The EDVAC was the first stored program digital computer. And there was this manual that was sort of a hack. How do you make that pile of stuff work? And that's where he wrote about his architecture. Um, we're still living with it. You know, I'm sure Qualcomm has a whole buildings dedicated to the lineage of that draft report. And it's really based on what I'd say is a mistake that was never meant to get that far. And I don't think he ever intended it. Um, von Neumann knew Turing very well. Um, Turing's machine was a thought experiment, not a serious computer. In the machine, there's a tape and there's a head. And to a physicist, the mistake is the head is distinct from the tape, meaning interaction is different from the persistence of the state. In von Neumann's architecture, that continues where there's the memory organ and there's the processing organ. And to process, you need to move data from the memory organ to the processing organ. What that means today is in, in this laptop here, it's spending many more cycles refreshing the memory and shuttling the memory to the processing organ, even though the memory transistors are just as powerful as the processing ones. Um, because we're living with this notion that um, the head is distinct from the tape. Von Neumann did beautiful things. This was a hack. It's way past its due date. So a couple years ago, we started an amusing project, which is to ask, what if they just got it wrong? Let's do a do-over. We had a good couple decades. But rather than pretending hardware and software are different, what if you, from the beginning, tried to make software look like hardware? And so this is a project we, we did with DARPA, looking at exascale computing to re-implement everything from transistors up to the software stack, where you represent software in a way that respects physics. And so this isn't new, in a sense. It has about 20 antecedents. But what we're doing here is um, uh, bits propagate asynchronously through a medium in which they interact. And we develop programming tools to do the blahs, the routines for high performance computing. And in this world, the distance you travel is proportional to the time to travel, which is proportional to the amount you store, which is proportional to the amount of interaction you can do. Those are all property of the underlying computing medium. And what's really nice is in this world, um, what I'm showing now is if you zoom a Google Maps, you go from this building, city, state, country, but you don't change geometry. If you zoom this computer, you go through about five levels of changes of representation. Each of those is a serious pain point. What's nice in this world is all of the issues like um, thread concurrency and cache misses and backplane interconnect sort of go away because they're implicit in the representation. And we implemented that in, in a number of different types of physics, trying to actually make software look like hardware. And in many ways, it turns out it's easier, not harder, once you do it that way. So what all of that leads up to is that was just a quick tour of how to think about computing kind of in harmony, not in opposition to physics. And it leads to an even bigger story, which is 
Shannon wrote the best master's thesis ever. This was at MIT in 1936. And in his master's thesis, he developed the modern notion of digital. He showed how to make universal um, digital logic. He went on to prove the first threshold theorem, which is an analog phone call degrades with distance. He showed if I give you a symbol for a linear increase in the resources representing the symbol, there's an exponential reduction in the fidelity to decode it as long as noise is below a threshold. It's called a threshold theorem. And that's the real meaning of digital. It's not ones and zeros, it's that th exponential scaling. Very few exponentials in engineering, that's the heart of what Shannon did. Um, Shannon and von Neumann overlapped at the Institute for Advanced Study. Von Neumann went on and proved threshold theorems for computing. Essentially, you view the computation as a message, a communication through the computer, and he showed how you can compute reliably with unreliable computing devices. Uh, 1952, um, oh, uh, MIT made the first NC mill, the first computer-controlled manufacturing machine. State-of-the-art advanced manufacturing today hasn't really progressed since then. The computer moves an end effector, but there's no information in the material. The information is in the computer. It doesn't belong on this slide. So a couple years ago, we ran a meeting with the White House and a bunch of agencies on an emerging science of fabrication, which is not about digitizing designs. It's not about additive versus subtractive. It's about coding construction by putting information into materials. And so in stages, we're progressing from computers controlling machines to rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines. That's the stage Tron mentioned. Um, ask me later, I'll tell you about that. But I wanna talk now about how you put codes and then programs into materials. So um, think about a child playing with Lego bricks. Uh, you don't need a ruler. The geometry comes from the part, so a child can make something bigger than themselves, unlike a printer today that's limited by the build volume. Um, the tower is more accurate than the motor control of the child. Errors don't accumulate. You can detect and correct errors. You can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar materials. It's very hard to do heterogeneous printing. And when you're done, you don't put it in the trash. You take it apart, and you use the bricks again. None of that applies to almost any advanced manufacturing. All of that, that applies to Lego bricks and to amino acids, the things that make you. So this is where scaling nano Lego. You, the scale bar here is about 300 nanometers. So processes to make nano Legos and assemblers to place them. Um, on the micro scale, this is micro Lego making 3D electronics, not by etching and depositing, but by, by um, Lego bricks of electronic material. And then here's a really neat machine, which is not in a printer, but an assembler. So this has a feedstock, not yet of the nano, but of the micro Lego. And then um, this is like the kid playing with the Lego. It, it has multiple heads of the parts. It just needs to get close enough to fit them. But the constraints, the geometry, and the error correction is coming from the parts, and it builds 3D volumes. Um, then if you make... A, to make bigger things, if you make the little parts you're assembling out of carbon fiber, um, we set the world record for the highest performance ultralight material. Today, when you make a jumbo jet, you need tooling the size of the jumbo jet. We showed instead, if you link little loops of carbon fiber, you can make much lighter and much stronger materials. So you can do things like make airplanes that have wings that can change shape. Um, and so to make those, uh, then here's an assembler, but this is a really interesting assembler. This is now getting more like a ribosome. It's an assembler that crawls on the structure it's assembling. So a little part can make a big structure. And so we're working with Airbus on making airplanes and NASA on um, space fabrication this way, where you can flat pack a spaceship and then, then assemble it in space. Um, then from there, even more interesting is to code the construction. This is math we did for how to do the inverse of an NP-complete problem and turn a code into a 3D design. So programmed folding. We developed electropermanent motors, a new kind of robotic actuator to have high torque at low RPM with static holding. And if you've heard of Google's Project Aura, some of you know my former student, Ara Kanayan. He's the Aura of Project Aura, which is the mechanism for the Google modular phone. Um, and so then, once you can do all of that, it then leads up to this, which is, um, this is a design tool uh, done by my student Amanda where you have bricks now, not just of semiconductors and conductors, but um, actuators. And by placing them, you can then start to compose functions like uh, motion stages and then walkers and then robots. And so 
to, to understand the scaling, I'll let that run. So she goes on and shows complexity. A digi-key stocks 500,000 types of resistors. We can make any resistance value and current capacity and form factor with three parts, a, a, a resistor, resistive part, a conducting, and an insulating. With just the conducting and insulating, we can make RF matching networks. With semiconductors, logic, and then with actuators, we can start to make um, robots out of it. And what we're just up to is this. Um, in biology, me, I'm made in primary structure is coding amino acids, secondary structure is little functional units, tertiary structure is the, uh, secondary is geometrical motifs, tertiary is functional units, and quaternary are the machines that make me move and talk and think. We're now starting to do that for engineering. So you assemble these little building blocks into parts that make functions, that make modules, and this is our first attempt at a design of an assembler that assembles assemblers to have exponential increase in assembly. Uh, which turns out to be essential for scaling. Um, and that finally brings us back to, I complained about von Neumann, but this he did write about carefully. The last thing he studied was self-reproducing machines. He studied it abstractly. We're now at a point to really think about being able to make them. Um, so if you get the home edition of the movie The Martian, there's a really fun special feature on it. Um, we did an event at um, 20th Century Fox with the White House and NASA and DARPA on the science of going to Mars, how to actually go there. And what I'm talking about is NASA was looking at going to Mars as essentially redoing the Industrial Revolution. What's coming out of this work is I'm made out of 20 parts. The amino acids, what's remarkable is they're unremarkable. They're hydrophobic, hydrophilic, basic, acidic, just typical. Um, and just good enough, and you can compose them to make motors and sensors and all of that. And so what I'm showing behind me, you can see bits from this talk, is with b ballpark 20 or so parts, you can do in engineering primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure to do amino acids for engineering to assemble complexity. And then you get all the properties of digital system. You get to detect and correct errors. You get hierarchical modularity. You get exponential scalability. Everything you know about communication and computation, you can then do for fabrication. And then finally, this is a sweep of we're reproducing the history of mainframes, mini computers, hobbyist computers to PCs. We're now going from mainframes of fab through mini computers of fabrication to personal computers to the Star Trek replicator. Remember, the internet was invented decades before the iPhone, not after. And the parallel here is, I just described a few decades of research to the replicator, but for the National Science Foundation, we started setting up community labs with early versions of these tools, community fab labs. Those went viral and accidentally started doubling. They've been doubling for a decade. There's about 1,000. And we've been working with heads of state and tribal chiefs and sort of really reinventing. If anybody can make anything anywhere, it completely changes what is education, what is work, what is money. So here's some follow-up, and I left a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Questions? Or comment? Yep. One second. Uh, you mentioned the Lego, you know, analogy. The question yep. here, what's the size of building block? So the question is the size of the building blocks for Lego. Um, so in amino acids, they only come in one size. Here, there, there's a scaling. So in your question, there's a dynamic range between the largest size of the system and the smallest feature you need to address, and that's not fixed. So one of our projects is we're part of the collaboration to do whole genome synthesis where the Lego brick is molecular. Another one of our projects is looking at 3D integrated electronics and optical metamaterial where the Lego bricks are hundreds of nanometers. Another is looking at things like um, satellites on orbit. The math is worth its weight in gold, but we burn it up because you can't use it. There, what we're doing is things like antennas, matching networks, and interconnect, where those are micron scale. For the stuff we're doing to build spaceships, it's centimeter scale. So it, it, the point is not the absolute size, it's the dynamic range. And in this world of sort of amino acids for engineering, you get to pick the scale factor related to the, the task you're working on. Hmm. 
See one back there and then one over here. Sorry. Hi, it's Connie Gunther. I used to be in aerospace. So I'm very interested in how you're working with Airbus uh, on these particular technologies. Yeah, so um, the, the work we were doing there was a real surprise. The, um, at that time, we were working on manufacturing with Spirit Aero System that used to be Boeing's factories. And they were complaining about how painful it is to join composites. It's a real vulnerability. So they said, can you do something to improve composite joining? And it was an unrelated project. We were working with them on fancy tooling. And then we had this sort of insight that there's this analogy between on the nanoscale, the assembly. And if you view the thing I showed you are there's no adhesives. It's mechanically reversible bonds linking carbon fiber loops. And in aerospace, long fibers are good, short fibers are bad. But here, what we're doing is we're making fiber loops and linking them. And what we showed is by designing a lattice that goes all the way back to Lord Kelvin, where you balance the degrees of freedom with the constraints, by an order of magnitude, we increase modulus in the ultralight regime of milligrams per cubic centimeter, and then showed a robot can locally assemble them. And then what's really interesting is by um, alternating rigid and flexural elements, what I showed in that little clip, you can design and design deformations instead of control surfaces. And so it saves weight. It improves aerodynamics. But the real driver actually is just the supply chain. The, you need a tool the size of the airplane to make parts of the airplane. Then you need an airplane bigger than the airplane to carry the airplane. And then you bolt it all together is killing Airbus and Boeing. And this essentially takes out the supply chain and makes final assembly the only assembly. And that logistics part is really, in, in many ways, the biggest driver. And that, of course, feeds into the NASA part, which is building in space. Um, there have been a lot of. 3D printing a drone, which are really silly projects. They have horrible mechanical properties. Uh, what we're showing is by not printing but assembling, you can beat state-of-the-art materials performance. So, so now with this new technology, um, does, does the material created actually perform a function? Like, you know, DNA, you know, changes the cells. So what does this thing do? And 20, 30 years from now, where do you think it'll be? Yeah, so um, I, I had made a mistake. It, in the thing on the left, what I'm showing is at the bottom are the 20 parts, like conducting, semiconducting, insulating. Then you have functional things assembled from them, like actuators. Then you have modules made from those, like walkers, and then we get up to the machines. I was trying very hard to work from the bottom up. Most recently, we've started, in a sense, cheating, and we're starting from the middle, meaning while we're still making the parts at the bottom, that's hard. But what we're doing in the middle is making these functional elements way, both, way below the level of reconfigurable robotics, but way above the primitive properties. Then we're composing them up to make the machines while we drive back down to the parts. And I'd say the most interesting question lurking there is, there's nothing in your genome that says five fingers. What you have in your genome is a developmental program. And so in this world, as you get exponential complexity, it means you have to move from describing the design of something to searching and designing in the space of developmental programs to lead to the thing is one of the most profound questions lurking here. And um, let me leave you with Trond at the edge of the stage that um, the stages I showed you of rapid prototyping to rapid prototyping, of rapid prototyping to coding to assembling, don't happen in series. They're all happening at once, but different time scales. But we're right in the invent the internet moment, which means we're, in, we're leading to this transition where anybody can make anything. And so I think the biggest message, the, the supporting message is the digital assembly. The biggest message is if anybody can make almost anything anywhere, this whole taxonomy of startups versus big companies versus industry really gets turned on the hot side. And that's in some ways the hardest part. And that's the thing in some ways I'm spending the most time on. Thank you. So I don't know about you, but you know, here's an observation. If you understand 100% what Neil talking about, you can change the world. <laughs> if you understand about 80%, you can run tech at Twitter or Facebook. If you understand 10%, you can maybe change your own field of work or the entire domain that you are an expert in. And if you understand about 2%, you get to introduce Neil. 
So on that note, I wanted us, whatever the case may be for you, to ponder this and discuss, and we'll take a 20-minute break. <laughs>